without further ado, let's get going. I know uh, we have limited lunch times here, so Henry's going to be controlling it from his end, and uh, I'll be I'll be talking over that. So again, nice to meet you all. Um, for those of you uh, who may not know me, once again, my name is John Bakhti. I'm a registered kinesiologist and a certified personal trainer. I've been working in the health sciences field since 2007. And uh, we can get started with the first question. Uh, I think it was great for Markham to uh, reach out to our community and have them uh, send in some of their questions. I know uh, it may be difficult staying active and there's so much information available online. So we're hopefully gonna be able to try to narrow that down for you and make it a little bit clearer. Uh, so for our first question, what is the recommended daily food intake for an average person and what does that look like? So I think uh, the new and latest Canada's food guide did a great job at um, really narrowing things down and finding balance in diet. The first point I'd like to make is food intake is really dependent on what you do throughout your day what you do throughout your day and um, what you do throughout your day and what your limitations are um, based on your health already. So uh, an average intake changes uh, from person to person. What I would recommend is depending on what your goals are, whether it's um, weight gain, building strength, building muscle, trying to lose weight, it'll change from person to person. Uh, I would definitely always recommend consulting with your doctor first to see if there are any limitations or uh, dietary restrictions first. But to answer this question, for a general person who does a little bit of exercise throughout the day, if we're talking strictly on calories, you'd want to be taking in anywhere from about 1,200 to about 2,000 calories a day. And that will be, again, dependent on your body composition, your, your bone structure, your, your muscle density. Um, your overall weight, your height, so much that will go into that. And it'll all be different for each individual person. Um, from the new Canada's Food Guide, I think they did a great job at really talking about getting those beautiful colored greens, fruits, vegetables in that diet. So if we take a plate, for example, if we take a plate, maybe half of that plate is going to be uh, more veggie based, you know, bright colors, the oranges, the yellows, the greens. You'd want to get a good amount of protein in. And again, that'll what your protein is will be, again, based on what your lifestyle is, what your limitations are. If you are more of a meat person, there are so many different types of proteins. But if you're more vegetarian-based or vegan-based diet, there's, once again, so many substitutes to meat, uh, beans, soy-based proteins. Um, if you're able to eat fish or eggs, there's so many ways to get creative with it. And there are tons and tons of new great recipes that people are sharing online and uh, through various cookbooks. And um, depending on how much time you have available right now, I'm sure a lot of you may still be working or if you have a few extra, a few extra hours throughout your day, you can get creative with your meals. Um, so if we're, if we're taking a plate, if we're taking a plate, oh, hello everyone, excellent. Uh, hi everyone, uh, we made it. Uh, good to see you all, this is great. Um, so I was just talking a little bit about Canada's Food Guide. And again, uh, what a plate should look like or daily recommended intake. What you can also get into is breaking it down from your macronutrients, which would be your proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. But you also don't want to neglect your micronutrients. So that's the vitamins and the minerals. So I had earlier, I had stated, you know, if you have a plate, half of it would ideally be vegetables. Quarter of it would be a protein. And then the other quarter of it would be grains, whether it be rice. Um, and then it's also coming down to the quality of the food that you're putting in your body, right? So um, you'll generally feel better if you're putting natural, healthier foods in your body. Me personally, I've been eating a lot healthier as of late, and I just feel better overall. So to answer this question a little bit faster, if you're talking strictly calories, um, for an average person, anywhere from about 1,200 calories to about 2,000 a day, it's just about an average, uh, average range. And again, that will change depending on your fitness goals. So if you're hoping to uh, gain weight or gain muscle, you may want to bring that up a little bit higher. Since you're also working out more and you're actually going to be burning off a few more calories, you'd want to be taking that in a little bit more as well. If you are just daily general health and wellness and you just want to maintain daily activities of living, you know, you would just moderate and adjust your calories in uh, throughout the day. Now, um, with that being said, it's also the quality um, of the food, like I mentioned earlier. 
Um, and again, um, there are so many other types of diets out there. And the other point I really want to make on this is simply whatever diet or, or uh, nutrition that you take on throughout your day, be consistent with it. Um, there has been a lot of research that shows that yo-yo dieting really isn't the healthiest. So maybe you do a, a low carb diet one week and then you change over to high fat diet and you go over to the keto. There's so many diets out there and you can really get lost in it all. And the biggest piece of advice I would like to share with you all is be consistent with it. If you know something works for you, stick to it. Don't get discouraged if you have a scoop of ice cream at the end of the day. Don't get discouraged if you, you know, have a half a pizza to yourself. Just making sure that there's balance in your diet and as your and making sure that you're as consistent as you can be throughout um, throughout your your weeks and and with your diet. So always keep that in mind. And um, if there's any other questions on this uh, topic specifically, I'd be happy to to speak on that a little bit later. Just type it in the question box below. And uh, I'll follow up with those questions as well. But it's good to finally get the video working. Hello, everyone. Um, great. So uh, I spoke on uh, the food intake for an average person. And the biggest takeaway from that is, again, um, every person is going to be different. Be consistent with your nutrition as much as you can. Don't beat yourself up if you, quote unquote, cheat or, or stray away from your, your normal course. That's fine. We're all human. We all have our our. Uh, our dietary devices. And again, always consult with your doctor and uh, get regular blood tests to make sure that um, your, uh, your levels are at a, a regular um, normal, normal level. Um, so we can move on to question two. Excellent. So proper components that make a make up a proper resistance exercise routine. Now to answer to start answering this question, I'm going to start off by saying understand what you want out of your resistance program. What goals are you looking for? Do you have imbalances? Do you have pain? Where where is the beginning part? And then from there, you can break it down into, you know, um, dividing it by how many days a week you'll be exercising, what muscle groups you want to target. Um, so the key components to uh, a proper exercise routine, I'll break it down simply as to this. You want to start off by first identifying your goals, knowing what the end goal is, but also making it attainable and realistic. Um, give yourself a fair amount of time. And hey, if you reach that goal sooner than later, excellent, even better. So that would be the first part, understanding your goals and giving yourself a fair and comfortable timeline. Frequency is also super important with it. And this is where we want to be realistic. So we can all say, I'm going to, I'm going to lift weights seven days a week. I'm not going to stop. But again, it has to be realistic. So again, based on your lifestyle, your work, if you have kids, your job, if you're finishing school, maybe you're doing some night classes, figure out what realistically you'll be able to maintain. So figure out your frequency anywhere from the more the better. So if you can maintain three to five days a week or whatever that may look like for you, um, that, that'd be another great place to start. The other components are again, understanding your limitations and what you need to work around. So if you have pain, I'd recommend maybe dealing with that pain first and, and working around that. If there are movement patterns or exercises that you're just not comfortable with, um, taking a step back and just starting off easy. We don't need to rush into the gym and start doing these intense workouts from the, from the second we get in there. It would be a matter of taking a small step back, looking at the bigger picture of it all, and then adding in the pieces to put this program together. So that's where I would start. When it comes to resistance programs, it has to be balanced. My personal philosophy is um, having a strong and engaged core and the ability to learn movements um, 
for specific exercises. So if we're talking about a deadlift, we want to make sure we know how to hinge at our hip. We know how to engage our torso. We know how to keep our, our, our chest up tall towards the ceiling. We know how to pull our shoulder blades back. So just understanding how to move our body. And that's not going to be perfect for everybody. And there is going to be a lot of trial and error. Uh, with that being said, there are tons of great um, fitness professionals within the city of Markham at various locations across uh, all of our community centers. And if you have any questions at all, I'm sure myself or any of all of the other uh, personal trainers and fitness staff will be able to help you with that. For me personally, what I think is always important is you don't want to overwork certain muscle groups, creating further imbalances down the road. So if you know you want to build muscle, you know, it's very traditional that we want to get bigger biceps, bigger chest, bigger shoulders, more of the, you know, beach body accessory muscles, but it also has to come with function. So if we're doing too much bench press or too much rowing, there's going to be an imbalance in there somewhere. So when you're putting a program together, make sure that you're not doing too much of one thing throughout the week. Make sure you're balancing it out as often and as much as you can. And with that being said, you want to make it fun and creative. What I would say to do too is once you put that program together or you get some guidance on putting that program together, follow suit with that for about a hey, two to three weeks. Let your body really adapt to what you're doing. And then from there, once you feel yourself getting stronger, you're able to do a little bit more, then adapt and change the program just slightly. Maybe you end up doing a few more repetitions, a little bit heavy weight. You start adding in more advanced exercises. And what you'll find is it will keep changing. And that's the beauty in taking on a health, a health and wellness uh, goal really is to um, adapt our body and change that over time. So those are some few key components just to summarize. Again, understanding your goals, understanding your frequency, working within your life. It's really coming down to your individual uh, routine and making it work for you and being as consistent as you can and, and seeking out information as, as often as you can because there's always new research coming out and it's always changing um, rapidly, really, throughout, throughout, um, throughout the months and the week. So, um, That'll be, that should answer that question. And again, if there are any other further questions, feel free to type it in the, in the chat below. We'll move on to, uh, we'll move on to the third question. Okay. Is it better? Okay. It's running better than fast walking in terms of improving fitness and weight loss, i.e. one and a half hours fast walking. Great question. Um, I've been asked this a lot. And again, it really comes down to what your goals are. If we're talking strictly on weight loss, how much time do you have? So there's tons of research talking about the interval style of training. And there are tons of benefits to that too. So if you're not really training for a long distance marathon and you're really strictly focusing on weight loss and you only have a little bit of a limited amount of time, then yeah, doing something like an interval program can be a lot more beneficial than running one and a half hours. To break this down uh, a little bit scientifically, when we're doing that one and a half hour light walk, it takes a period of time to get up to a, a comfortable level where we're in the fat burning zones of our heart rate compared to where if we're doing a high intensity where our heart rate is constantly changing, um, what's actually happening is we're keeping our heart rate at an elevated level, maintaining that within our fat burning zones so that once we finish that 10 minute sprints of that interval training, we have the added benefit of our metabolism and our heart rate staying elevated after that. So that would, again, add into the benefit of, of uh, weight loss. Um, a few other points I wanted to talk on with this is, I mentioned it earlier, with resistance training, as we build muscle, having a higher amount of muscle mass actually helps to boost our metabolism. So if we're thinking strictly on weight loss, don't be afraid to add in a few key uh, resistance training exercises that will actually help to uh, further um, increase your weight loss. And that would be a good complement to doing something like a 10 rounds of um, interval training compared to one and a half um, or 90 minutes of, of a, a light jog or a walk. Now, and again, like I mentioned earlier, it does come down to your limitations and what it is you're training for. If you know you have, you know, hip, knee and joint issues, if, um, you know, uh, you're predisposed to other health conditions. Again, consulting with your doctor or another health professional is always great, but understanding what your goals are. So if you do want to run a marathon, maybe doing more of the one and a half 
uh, one and a half or 90 minutes of, of a light jog or walking could be more efficient compared to if you're strictly looking on weight loss, then again, doing more of the high intensity training, but also not neglecting that afternoon walk or that 20 minute jog on the treadmill. Or again, if we are talking strictly on joint pain and issues with that, maybe going on a lower intensity uh, modality, something like an elliptical or an upright or an upright bike or a recumbent bike. Um, so there are a lot of different options to, um, to really help with this. But to answer this question um, simply, in my opinion, usually doing a high interval training program can be a little bit more beneficial than just doing longer steady state exercise. There's a lot of different factors that go into it. You know, are we doing fasted cardio? Um, what's your timeline situation like? And we can really delve into this a little bit more, maybe in another another Zoom talk if we um, if we have another webinar, maybe next week, and I can touch on that a little bit more, maybe specifically on certain topics. But uh, for this question, I would lean more towards the interval training program because a number of things uh, it's been shown to help with uh, blood glucose blood glucose levels, especially if you're diabetic, there's been benefits to that. Uh, it puts a healthy stress on the heart when done correctly. So again, reaching out to myself or another health professional in one of the marketing community centers. And also you get that added benefit after your exercise. So, you know, 10 to 15 minutes after getting off a treadmill or a bike, what's going to happen is that heart rate's going to stay elevated. Your metabolism is going to be constantly working. And as you go into the rest of your day, you're going to maintain for a period of time in that fat burning zone, uh, which will again add to weight loss. But again, if, if weight loss is the goal, um, really consider adding in uh, some resistance training to help build the muscle and further help uh, maintain that metabolism and, and um, help to lose some of that weight. Um, the other point, if we're talking uh, building muscle, if you think about it, um, there's muscle and fat. As we increase our, our muscle mass, the ratio of fat to muscle will start to decrease, which in turn will help to, to uh, decrease the fat um, and, uh, and ideally lose weight. But with that being said, muscle does weigh more than weight. So I hope I answered that um, as, uh, as much as I could. And again, if you have any other questions, we can uh, add it to the chat and we can move on to question four, please. Okay. All right, now exercises. Let me move around here a little bit so you can see me a little bit better. Excellent. All right, so what are some back exercises to do at home without any twisting motion and limited equipment? So we're going to start off nice and easy, and I'll break these down as simply as I can. So there are tons of exercises and depending on your level of fitness, you may have to gradually work up to some more of the advanced ones, but two I'm gonna show you today that are, are pretty straightforward and are, are useful for really anybody. Um, you can try these at home. A few things I'm gonna to touch on is we really wanna focus on muscle activation. Muscle activation will really help to prevent injury, but also get the maximal, uh, maximal benefit in the muscle itself. So, I'll just move this guy over here. First exercise we're going to start with is going to be nice and easy. We're going to be in a four-point position. We're going to be on our hands and our knees looking down towards the ground. So first thing I'd recommend all of us to do is just engage our core. So what, what, we'll, what we'll notice is if we just let our body just do whatever it like, you know, we'll be slouched, our shoulders will be up towards our ears, our back will be arching. So once we're in this position, making sure that we're staying engaged through our torso, our back, our shoulders are pulled back and down towards our hips, our shoulders are, on, are over top of our wrists, our hips are over top of our knees. Now, once we're here, like I had mentioned, we wanna engage the core, so we're gonna squeeze our tummy nice and tight, and we actually wanna tuck our pelvis. So if you look at my hip for a second, we don't wanna be arching our back too much, that could cause a little bit more compression through our lower back, so if we just tuck our hips underneath our shoulders and we engage our, our, our core a little bit more and we pushing our hands down into the floor, we're now engaged and we're set. So the progression of this exercise is we'll simply start just by extending our heel, straightening out that leg, extending the heel. The reason why I say extend with the heel is we're gonna get a little bit more uh, muscle activation through our glutes and hamstrings. So from here, I'd recommend pointing the toes down towards the ground. We're gonna 
kick that heel back. And what we're really looking for here is just a good extension, muscle activation through our, our legs in this case simply. And we're not arching that back as high as we can. We're not looking up to the ceiling and really exaggerating that movement. We're emphasizing the movement from the muscle and activating as many associative muscle groups as we can throughout this process. So staying tight through the torso, we're gonna lead with that heel. And this will in turn help to improve that lower back. Now, to make this more advanced, we'll just add an arm component to that. We're gonna stay in the same position, chin's tucked, tummy's tight. So let's say we're extending our left leg. What we can do now is actually raise up our right arm at the same time. Now, what I'd recommend everyone to do is actually have your palm facing in with your thumb up rather than our palm down. Reason for that is we're opening up the shoulder and it'll create uh, less pressure through that shoulder joint. So we're looking down to the ground. We're gonna lead with that heel, bringing that arm up at the same time. And from here, if you find your balance is that isn't as good as it could be, this is a great exercise to not only help the back, but also our balance throughout this process too. So again, chin's tucked. We're gonna lead with the heel, bringing that arm up, pausing for a second and back down. And whenever you're doing any type of resistance training or exercises, you don't wanna hold your breath. You wanna focus on your breathing as much as you can. So we're gonna exhale as we straighten, inhale on the way back down. And you can also notice that I'm holding that at the top. Now, to get the maximal benefit from the muscle, we wanna put a tension over time on that muscle to get the maximal benefit. Now, we don't need to hold it for that long, but just enough to get that full engagement from the muscle, holding that for a second, slow and controlled on the way back down. There are some exercises that are meant to be done quickly, but if we're focusing on decreasing lower back pain and strengthening our torso and just becoming a little bit more mobile, take your time with it, focus on the muscle doing the movement and engage throughout it. So once again, nice and simply leading with the heel, extending that leg as we bring that arm up. So that would be the first one I'll show you. The second one that you may or may not have seen, it's simply called the Superman. Now, I'll show a few modifications for this one. So if you do have um, some heart issues, lung issues, it may be uncomfortable or contraindicated to have you on your stomach. So again, um, I would recommend maybe doing the one that we just did earlier compared to a Superman. If there are no complications, uh, this is a great exercise to strengthen pretty much our posterior chain, everything just throughout our back. So what we're gonna be doing here is again, we're focusing on body alignment. We're on our stomach. We're gonna have our arms by our side with our palms up, chins tucked, looking down towards the ground. And from here, what we're gonna do first is actually drive our shoulders up towards the ceiling as we pull them down and towards our back pocket. So right now we're activating our, our rotator cuffs, our shoulder blades, all those muscles in the back there that I'll get into a little bit later. As you can see, I'm actually looking down towards the floor, not up. Reason for that is I'm relieving a lot of pressure through the back of my neck just to avoid further muscle imbalances. So first step is again, pulling our shoulders up towards the ceiling as we pull them down and back. We're actually gonna raise our arms up, looking down towards the floor. And we're gonna try our best to use those muscles to get our chest off the ground, activating everything. So really exaggerate that squeeze. If you can see, I'm bringing my arms up pretty high. I'm activating tons of muscles through my back here. To add a little bit more for the lower back here, we're actually gonna lift those legs off the ground and we're gonna turn into a bit of a superman. Now, when it comes to breathing, this is gonna be super uncomfortable if you're holding your breath for a little bit longer uh, than you should be. So again, focus on a good hard exhale. Exhale as we come up, chin stuck. Inhaling, slow and controlled on the way back down. Exhaling as we lift, chin's tucked. We're pulling our shoulders away from our ears. So we're going up, back, and down rather than hiking our shoulders up. If our shoulders were closer to the ears, we'd get a lot of stiffness throughout the neck, and that's what we want to avoid, right? So again, great two exercises for the lower back. Going into that Superman and back down. And back down there. 
If you have any questions about either of those, again, type it in the chat. I'll be happy to break it down for you a little bit more. But a few points that I'm getting at when it comes to exercises and movement is muscle engagement, tempo, and breathing. Okay. Um, we can head on to question the fifth. Uh, hamstrings, yes. Uh, hamstring exercises. So I'm sure uh, not all of us have a leg curl machine at home or a big squat rack or a leg press at home. So this is a great question. How do we activate our hamstrings? So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna get on our back. Now I'll show you the first exercise here and then I'll show you more of an advanced version afterwards. So we're gonna get on our back with our arms by our side. So this is actually two exercises in one and we'll get a lot of benefit activating the glutes. But again, we're also gonna make sure that we're activating more at the hamstrings. So how we're gonna activate more of the hamstrings is we're gonna go into a glute bridge. What we're gonna do here is have our arms by our side. We're gonna pull our shoulders away from the ears. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna push our hips up towards the ceiling as high as we can. Now, again, a few things to remember is breathing, muscle activation, and again, body alignment. So also, you wanna make sure that we're not tilting to one side or the other. We wanna make sure that our shoulders are away from our ears so that as we come up, our shoulders aren't hiking up towards our ears. Arms are gonna be by our side, heels towards our hips. <sighs> Exhaling as we drive that up nice and high. Now, how we're gonna activate more of our hamstrings for this is we're gonna go on towards our heels with our toes pointing up. And as you stay in that glute bridge position, we are actually going to walk our heels out and then come back down. Now, as we lower, now this will be more of a dynamic exercise here. So if you've noticed, what we're gonna now do is keeping my the heels further away from my hip, I'm gonna prop up, definitely feeling that a lot more through my hamstrings. Walking back, trying to bring the heels as close to the hips as possible. And as we lower, we're actually gonna lower through the middle back, down towards the lower, down towards the hips. So that is the hips that lower at the very end. What we're doing here is actually getting a little bit more of a spinal rotation, opening up that back a little bit, seeing a little bit more of a stretch and properly activating these muscles a little bit further. Now, if you do get a hamstring cramp, it's not uncommon, just straighten out that leg. And if you are consistently getting hamstring cramps, that may be a sign of um, poor hydration, maybe you're not drinking enough water, nutrition, maybe you're lacking certain micronutrients, or maybe you're just not activating what we should do. So to start off again, to avoid that nasty hamstring cramp, arms by our side, shoulders away from the ears, we're gonna squeeze our bum nice and tight as we push our feet down into the floor. Coming up high, going back on towards our heels, and nice and easy. Just walking forward, and from here we're gonna rotate our pelvis right back down, staying in this position with our heels further apart. Exhaling as we bring the heels, as we bring our hips back up, and staying in that position as we walk our heels back to the hip, rotating back down. So that's one exercise. And what you can actually do is if you have um, uh, one of those paper plates or, or a towel that you put on the ground, what you can actually do is go into that same position. And rather than walking out, what you can actually do is if you put plates on the ground, you can actually you know slide, slide your, your legs out as you maintain that glute position, and that'll definitely activate a lot more of the hamstrings. The last exercise for the hamstrings I'd like to try, and you can do this on your bed or sofa or couch at home. I personally have a bench, and to activate, it's gonna be very similar, but slightly more advanced. What we're gonna do, we're gonna have our heels on the bench here, walking our hips, towards that bench with our toes pointing up. And to really activate more of the hamstrings, we wanna maintain a bit more of a 90 degree 
at our hips and our knees. And again, to make this a little bit more advanced and to get a little bit more mobility through the spine and the back, arms are gonna be by our side once again. We're getting those shoulders away from the ears, toes pointing up to the ceiling. And guess what? We're gonna lead with our heels. And the goal here is to actually, as we drive our heels into the ground, we're actively trying to pull our heels towards our hips. Now, obviously that's not gonna happen. This bench isn't gonna fall over, hopefully not. That would be for the blooper reel. Let's just try to avoid that. But, arms by the side, shoulders away from the ears. Good deep breath in, right? We're thinking about breathing. And what I'm doing is actively driving my heels towards my hips, getting a lot more glute activation, but also tons of hamstring activation. Definitely try these at home. And as we lower, again, for the safety of our back, middle, lower, hips. Good, strong exhale as we powerfully Extend our hips, pushing our heels into the ground, slow and controlled on the way down. So like I mentioned, some exercises are meant to be done fast. Usually, we want to have a forceful and controlled contraction. So we're concentrically activating or shortening the muscles through our legs. And a slow and controlled eccentric phase, which is a simply controlled elongation of our muscles as we roll back down. So... Essentially, there are two different exercises, but the movement patterns are very similar. One other hamstring exercise that you can try at home with little to no equipment is simply a straight-legged deadlift. And now, if you don't have anything at home, you can use a weighted bag, put some textbooks, cookbooks in a, in a Ziploc bag or a duffel bag to add a little bit of weight. But again, you don't really need to do this. This is definitely more of an advanced exercise, but we'll get a ton of uh, hamstring activation. So if you are a little bit more advanced in your training, what you'll do is you'll have something weighted in front of you. Or again, if you just want to practice it at home to get your movement patterns down pat, from here, tummy's nice and tight, shoulders back and down. We're activating our hips and our glutes. And we're going to go into a hip hinge. We're going to bend our knees just slightly, but the movement is strictly going to come at our hips. Because if you think about it, the hamstrings actually attach right above where our hip bones are, just right around just the top of the actual pelvis itself. And it goes all the way down just to underneath that knee. So to get isolated in the hamstrings, we're going to bend the knees just a touch and we're going to hinge at the hip, keeping tension through the shoulders, keeping our shoulders down and back. And from here, we're going to push our hips back as we bring our upper body forward. Good stretch through the hamstrings. And how do we get back up? We're going to squeeze the bum nice and tight as we come back in. Inhaling on the way down, feeling that lengthening through the hamstrings. Pause and right back up. So those are three good hamstring exercises ranging from more beginner to more advanced. Definitely try these out. If you have any questions about them, feel free to reach out to any of the marketing staff or myself. I'll be happy to help you at any time. Just here. Okay. So um, from now, we can definitely move on to uh, to our question period. I hope you all found this very useful. Uh, I apologize again for the uh, technical difficulties. Uh, at the beginning with the video, but uh, it's very nice that you can all see me now. Um, put a face to the voice. Um, and uh, if uh, there were any questions at all, um, maybe Henry, if you wanted to read them out, if there were any questions. Um, Excellent presentation, John. So yeah, I'm just awaiting some questions. If you guys have any questions, please type them in the, the chat box and John will answer them for you. No, but I, uh, I'm looking forward to getting back into the, uh, the community centers and seeing all the, the members' faces again, catching up with them, hearing what they've been up to. Uh, I hope you're all staying you know, health and, um, healthy and safe. Uh, staying active as much as you can. I hope I hope these have uh, this lunch and learn has been uh, very useful for you and helpful. Um, I think uh, I'm 
So I think we have a few questions here. Yeah, so, so here's one. What exercise for the IT band with, for someone with knee pain? Oh, oh, hi, Mark. Um, hello. Uh, yes, IT band exercise, especially for knee pain. Great. So what we can do here is let me just adjust the screen here. So the IT band is a tricky, tricky thing. It's this tendinous fascia that runs like all the way down our lateral side. And I get tons of questions about this. It's always, uh, uh, a uh, point of uh, concern for a lot of people, uh, and it is quite related to um, to the knee joint. So, a few exercises that I'll show you. Uh, one of them with limited equipment. You just need a wall or a chair to maintain your balance. So, if I'm going to be stretching or, or lengthening my IT band on my right side, what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to take a step forward with my left foot. I'm going to take a good step back into the left with my right leg here. So now what we're doing is we're already opening up this lateral line. Now, the one point I will like to make for the IT band is it's actually meant to be relatively taut or, or stiff or tight because it acts as a, um, an absorber and a connector for a lot of our lower body parts. So it's really help to relieve a lot of the uh, knee pain, which maybe that'd be a great idea for another question maybe next week, is to activate and strengthen the muscles all around the hip to relieve the pressure at the knee. But for the IT band, like I was saying, left foot forward, we're gonna bring that right foot back and behind. And depending on that stiffness or the tightness, you may already feel, feel that pull coming from just along the outside of the top of the hip. We're then gonna bring our right hand up and over, to our left as we push our hips to the left there, or to the right, excuse me. Now, depending on how stiff you are, you would again limit your, you would again limit your uh, range of movement. If you already feel the stretch coming just from pushing your hips up, so if you can't see what I'm doing here, I'm essentially up against the wall. My right foot is behind and across my left, and I'm just pushing my hips to the right as I reach up into the left with my left arm. Now, there's a dynamic style of stretching and a, and, a, and a static. So static would be actually holding it for, you know, 20 to 30 seconds, maybe a minute. So we could actually hold that as we reach, or you could make it more dynamic. If let's say at the beginning of your workout, you really wanted to loosen up your hip, yeah, I would definitely recommend maybe doing more of a dynamic stretch. So what that would look like is maybe three to four repetitions of, three to five second holds. Essentially what we're doing is priming that muscle Oops, as we reach back over. And then to end the workout, you would again, maybe hold that for 30 seconds or so. Another uh, good stretch for the IT band would be if we're seated on the ground here, if we're long sitting, what we can do is actually bring that right leg over and across our left, sitting up nice and tall. Side, you can see me better. Sitting up tall, shoulders relaxed, and using that left hand to pull that knee towards you and to the left as we twist and rotate to the right. And again, we can make that more dynamic going through the movement and pausing. But regarding the IT band, I think one very useful tool would be to strengthen the muscles that surround the IT band to essentially relieve the pressure on the IT band and the hip itself, um, because the IT band can be a tricky thing. Um, the other thing I would recommend, um, and again, do your own research on this, but from what I'm reading, um, try to avoid foam rolling directly on the IT band. Um, the reason for that is, um, again, like I mentioned, we do want it to be taut and actually foam rolling it could add uh, further inflammation and uh, um, more of that uh, nagging pain down the road. Uh, so again, if you are foam rolling, it would be a matter of foam rolling the muscles that are around the, uh, the hip uh, as well. So, great. If there are any other questions, we have cancer. Let's move on to another question here, John. Um, so uh, are there any shoulder exercises to do at home without uh, equipment? Are there any what exercises? Shoulder exercises. Shoulder, yes, yes. Okay. 
Yes, yes, there are. Um, so depending on what it is you're trying to do. Now, let's say we're looking to stabilize our shoulder. Let's say we're having some issues with, with pain and we really want to stabilize it. Um, a few exercises that we can do um, that would, again, also help to uh, work other muscles within the body. One of them just being a plank. But I'm going to show you a quick trick as to how to focus on the shoulder a little bit more. So what we can do, usually for the plank, people tend to do them with their fists together. Sideways here, so you can see. <clears throat> to activate more of the shoulders here, to get them a little bit more stable, the slight modification we would do is separate our fists. We're going to keep our fists over top of our elbows. And again, we're taking our shoulders out of that internally rotated position and more exter externally rotated. Another um, great thing, if you have limited equipment for the shoulders, is again, just get creative with what you have around your house. If you have anything that weighs two to 10 pounds, you can get a really good shoulder workout with something that weighs not too much. If you have, uh, like I mentioned earlier, um, soup cans. If you have soup cans, you can get into lateral raises. A few other shoulder exercises that you can do, one being, again, a push-up. It is more chest-based, but that works a lot of the shoulder. Um, if you have some bands at home, we can definitely do rows. Um, and again, uh, for those, for the shoulder specifically, um, it can be tricky, but there's tons of um, stabilizer exercises that you can do. Uh, push-ups are excellent. You can do rows if you have that ability. Um, and again, if you have something that weighs anywhere from um, two to 10 pounds or something that you're comfortable using, you'd be able to do some of the more traditional lateral raises if you're looking for muscle building. If you're looking for stability, another good exercise for shoulders here as well would be that of a shoulder tap. Um, it puts a lot of tension and pressure on the shoulder joint itself. So you can do this one of two ways. You can do this in a uh, assisted push-up position with your knees wider apart and you would again just tap your shoulders a more advanced version for this would be in a full push-up position and what you would do is just lean your body weight over to that supporting arm a light tap and you're gonna feel all that pressure through the shoulder and back over and across now if you're looking for you know, those cannonball shoulder workouts where you're just getting these huge delts and you don't have any equipment at all. Um, again, like I said earlier, I'm sure there's something in your house that weighs uh, within that range that's easy enough to grab and then you can get into your lateral movements. Um, what I would recommend too is uh, I've seen a few interesting videos where people may um, use pants and actually attach it to a door and use that as a, uh, a TRX or a pulley uh, to activate more of the posterior shoulder. Um, but hopefully that touches on that question. And again, if uh, you want something certainly specific to what your goals are, reach out um, after this and I can try to help, uh, help with that as well. Thank you, John. Uh, so it looks like uh, we're the wrap up this uh, webinar. Uh, if anyone has further questions for John to answer, feel free to email groupfitness at markham.ca. And then uh, we will subscribe you to uh, our Friday's newsletter where you can see group fitness, information, fitness contests, healthy recipes and staff highlights, as well as exercise of the week and uh, future webinar links. Also, the information is free for anyone who wants to join. So uh, spread the word to your network, tell your friends and family, and to stay active and healthy at, the, at home during this time. Thank you so much for watching, everybody. I hope, uh, I hope you found this useful. And if, uh, if there was something specifically out of any of those five questions that I didn't touch on, feel free to reach out. Uh, I hope you found this very informative and fun. Uh, sorry again for the technical difficulties at the beginning, but uh, it was really nice of you to tune in. I hope this made your lunch uh, a little bit more enjoyable. And uh, continue to stay safe and healthy out there. Uh, keep that community close. I think Markham does a great job at doing that. And uh, thank you to Henry and uh, all of the, uh, the Markham supervisors for, for letting me do this. And uh, hopefully it can turn into a weekly thing uh, with new, new content uh, coming out. So um, I look forward to seeing you all uh, back in our community centers and in the community very soon. Thank you so much. For